everyone, I'm Emily Chang. Thank you all for joining us. We are here with the CEO of SoftBank Group International, COO. We'll have you with us. Thank you so much for stopping by. Hi, Emily. It's great, great to be here. Great to be able to chat so in the virtual only, world. Yes, indeed. The only hint I had about what we would be talking about is that you were going to be in Miami. So you are joining us from Miami today, where you've just announced that SoftBank is going to invest an additional $100 million in Miami, Miami startups, and the ecosystem there. Tell us more about why and where this money is going to go. So um, I, I guess most people that are in the tech world have been following the amazing work that Mayor Suarez is doing of showcasing Miami to the tech world and a uh, knowing that Miami is so close to us, so close to SoftBank and so close to myself, we couldn't not be part of it. And we are huge believers that in order to propel a tech hub, you need two things. You need talent. And the amazing thing of this pandemic is that people are free to live wherever they like. And once people have a chance to come and visit Miami once, especially from certain places in the West Coast, then suddenly people love Miami and they want to stay. So there's talent. But usually the second piece is capital. And uh, what we decided to do today is to make, a, we call it the 100 million SoftBank initiative. And that is basically, we all got together within SoftBank and we made a commitment to $100 million to startup companies that are either in Miami or that are moving to Miami. So when you combine talent with capital and with so many people moving to Miami these days, we wanted to make sure that we contribute to, to Mayor Suarez, who is truly welcoming to see a government official actually embracing tech. So is this new money or is this money coming from some of SoftBank's other funds, like the Latin America Fund? I mean, we will make a decision as the investment come, and we just put a number of 100 million. I mean, it could be much larger due to the fact that we have the Vision Fund, we have the Latin American Fund, we have the Opportunity Fund, and we have SoftBank's balance sheet. But the message that we wanted to send is this is money that's 100% allocated to startups, and we're doing investment that traditionally maybe we wouldn't do, maybe helping more in the startup scene, but I think Miami needs the capital in order to continue to you know, uh, become more of a tech city, which the major is doing, is trying so hard. So Miami has been the talk of tech Twitter, at least until a few days ago when it became GameStop, but you've got a number of big name investors that have left San Francisco, for Miami, Peter Thiel just bought a house there. What's Miami got on Silicon Valley? Like, convince me. I mean, all you have to do is come and spend a couple of days here, and you will see, you know, the vibe that this city has, the quality of life that this city has, the difference in taxes that this city has. And I think just a hungrier government that's welcoming the tech ecosystem to say, you know, his favorite, his favorite words are, how can I help? You know, and, and traditionally, we're not used to the how can I help from government agencies. So when you have a government that's welcoming you, you have an amazing quality of life, which has become quite important. When the world has moved where we can move around, we don't need to be in, in one place. We can choose where we want to live. You have capital. You have the brains of Silicon Valley, the brains of New York moving to Miami. The magic starts cooking, and you see so many people. You know, I was just walking through Miami the last couple of days, and I saw so many people that I used to go see in Silicon Valley that I used to go see in Miami. So it's great. Everybody's here. Everybody's putting up ideas, and, and I think we're into something special. And by the way, Miami I think has probably, a great soccer Miami has well, a great soccer yes. team, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm sure there's people looking at the blue sky behind you and feeling a little jealous. Um, that said, talk of Miami being a tech hub is kind of just talk right now. Miami attracted less than 1% of all venture dollars invested in the U.S. last year. How much more of that share do you think it can claim? I mean, everything starts somewhere, right? And, and what it takes is, again, it takes a, a government that is willing to make it easier. It takes capital coming. And hopefully today we, we took a first little step. We say, look, there is dedicated capital. And I met with a lot of venture capitals, uh, venture capitalists and a lot of private equity, and they're all ready to put capital into. And you have a lot of companies that are moving to Miami. So I would say this is the beginning. And everything starts with, a, with first baby steps. And I think today we're making baby steps 
to make sure that Miami will be a player in the tech ecosystem. And also, you know, all of us today have learned how to work remotely, how to work virtually. And, and a lot of the big tech companies and big companies from the world are telling its employees, look, we understand the concept of a traditional headquarters dead, and the future is going to be a distributed workforce where employees are going to be allowed to live, you know, and work wherever they want. And this is where we work suddenly becomes an, an incredible value proposition for people to be able to use the different we work to show up to work, establish new startups and all that. So I think the world is changing. I think new habits have been developed during this pandemic, and I think that puts Miami in a really good place. So you're in Miami. I know you also live part of the time in New York. You've got Masayoshi son in Tokyo. How has this new way of life or the way of life for the last nine months impacted the way that you interact, how you manage and run the companies together? I think we're a lot, or I think we're a lot more efficient. Definitely, there's no need to fly 20 hours to get to Tokyo to have meetings. You know, today we communicate virtually. We use Zoom, we use uh, different uh, video applications, and we're able to, I would say, work as efficient, or if not more efficient, in terms of the movement of information. Now, what you do miss is you miss the ability to interact with people, and this is why I think the office will come back because you know you, you miss the innovation, you miss the mentoring, you miss those face-to-face -face conversations that are special in as we develop or, or plant. However, you know we haven't I don't, I don't think we missed a bit. We continue to do investment at the same pace at the same pace that we were doing before. So I mean we haven't stopped. as a matter of fact, I think uh, I, I think this pandemic has massively accelerated, the deployment of these technology companies that otherwise might have taken a little longer. But I think we have accelerated five to 10 years of how the world has changed. This, this technology yeah. revolution, as we call it, the AI revolution, was meant to happen, but the pandemic massively accelerated the digitalization of the world. SoftBank shares, meantime, have been on a tear uh, recently hit an all-time high given that it's moved away from being an operating company to being more of an investment holding company with a lot of different parts some parts rolling off like uh arm selling to nvidia why do you think it's doing so well because we started to you know we put together a plan at the beginning of the year we shared a plan in terms of we were going to for the first time, I would say in company's history, we put a plan to basically monetize some of the non-strategic assets that weren't part of our future, and we decided that we wanted to become an investment company. So the first step was the merger between Sprint and T-Mobile. The second was the, the monetization that we did of the T-Mobile shares. I think that was the second largest secondary offering in U.S. financial market history. Then we sold a Arm. We are selling our energy business. We are so we sold Brightstar. We are continually selling or operating companies, and we have decided that we're going to focus on investing, which is what we want to do. And because of that, we have the Vision Fund One, we have Vision Fund Two, we have our own balance sheet, we have the Latin American Fund, we have the Opportunity Fund. So we have funds that are investing in in what we always said we wanted to do, and that is we're on the verge of we, we call it the most advanced revolution in terms of disruption of the way we live, the way we work, and the way we play. And we wanted to make sure that we had sufficient dry powder to take on this new set of opportunities. And, you know, I, I don't think SoftBank's balance sheet has been, I mean, I think they're in the best shape we've ever been. To, been. I think we have more liquidity and more dry powder than we've ever have. And in a time where there's going to be great opportunities, I think we're properly positioned to continue to take advantage of these opportunities. So given that the world seems to be changing dramatically by the day and you have that dry powder, where are we going to see you doubling down aside from Miami? No, no, it's the same. I mean, our, our investment philosophy has not changed at all, right? And that is, you know, we're going to continue to invest in companies that utilize data and artificial intelligence to disrupt traditional business models. We like companies that are making the way we work, the way we live, the way we play, making the world a better place. And that's why, you know, you've seen us make investments on e-commerce eh, or food. We have doubled or tripled down on food delivery. Grocery delivery has massively changed. We're huge believer in autonomous vehicles. I mean, we're going to see autonomous massively accelerated. 
we invest on telemedicine, we invest on companies that are technology driven to do this type of video conferences. FinTech is changing the way we move our money. Fitness is being done differently. We're in the midst of an edtech revolution. Real estate is being transacted differently. And media, AI media, such as ByteDance or TikTok is changing the way we consume. So the whole world is moving, is changing so fast right now. And, these are, and there are a few disruptors, companies that are basically changing the way we live. And those are the companies that we're investing because those are the companies that are, we believe are going to be the next winners of the next years and the next decades. So speaking of disrupting traditional networks, I mean, we can't avoid the biggest story of the moment, which is what's happening with GameStop, um, you know, what's happened with Robinhood today with respect to that. And I'm curious, do you see what's happening now as a fundamental shift in where power lies, whether it's in institutions or with the people, or is this just a moment of temporary insanity? It's not, it's not, it's, it may, you might call it a moment of temporal insanity, but you cannot run away from reality that because of the pandemic, we have created now millions and millions of people because of the low cost of entering into a stock and the low cost of exiting into stock. Now you have a diversified force of, I don't know, it was 14, 15 million people who are basically trading stock. So you cannot ignore them. I mean, they are a, one of the driving forces as it relates to you know, acquiring company stocks or future IPOs or future ways in which companies will go public. I mean, you cannot, you know, you cannot ignore that. It's a new, it's definitely a new way of investing. However, yes, the madness, you know, the madness that we've lived through the game stock, stock or through AMC and all that, I think we need to look at that and we need to learn, you know, how to make sure that that doesn't happen again, because I don't think the stock market was set up to do this sort of speculation. So I think, what, what, what we've learned from this is there's a very strong group of people that before they were not being considered, and from now on are people that are making markets, and we got to take them seriously, and we're going to understand it, and there will be a driving force going forward. Absolutely. I mean, does it have you worried about bubble? I mean, I feel like, you know, I've been covering tech for 10 years, and we've been asking that question for 10 years, um, and markets keep going up. Um, at, at some point, is there a correction? I mean, I mean, there will be corrections for certain companies, but you cannot underestimate how new companies, mainly tech companies, are basically growing at an accelerated space that otherwise they wouldn't because of the pandemic and because of the, digi of the digital world that we're living today. So the market is not used to, but I mean, you have all, I call them these new tech companies that are massively disrupting and transforming traditional business models. So you're going to see those companies grow fast in value because they're disrupting, you know, traditional business models. Uh, and the market is valuing because they see the power and they see the potential, uh, the earnings potential that those companies can have in the future. So I don't think that will be adjusted. Now, the craziness that we've lived the last couple of days, sure. I mean, those things that, you know, that doesn't make any sense, a company that doesn't generate those earnings to be valued that long and to drop 150% the following day and go up 70%. No, I don't think the market was set up for that. But, you know, we're living at a moment where tech companies are going to continue to grow and are going to continue to be valued a lot at, a, at very high multiples. Also, the cost of money being so low because there's so much money being popped into the economy, then basically that accelerates these companies reaching profitability and that's why you start seeing those valuations. Meantime, you've got the power of big tech, various different big tech platforms being scrutinized for different reasons, whether it's Facebook and Twitter for blocking Trump or Apple for uh, the App Store or Amazon. Um, you know, you've got experience dealing with U.S. regulators, with Sprint and T-Mobile, with a new administration. What action do you think that Biden's team should take on big tech? Are you in the camp that, that some of these companies need to be broken up or fair play? I'm in the camp that we need to analyze every situation differently, and we cannot make bold statements that big tech needs to be regulated. I mean, it doesn't happen. You cannot regulate things the same way you could regulate in the past because this information flows all over the world. I just think each case needs to be seen separately. Uh, however, I'm a big believer that the least amount of government intervention, the better it is in order for businesses to be able to grow. Because at the end, these businesses 
we cannot forget are the ones that are employing people. And if you look at the most, at the largest increase of employment that we've had throughout the world, is this gig economy workers. There are different type of workers that we got to learn how to basically integrate into a traditional uh, working model. But we cannot, we, we, we can never forget of who is creating those jobs directly or indirectly and be careful with over-regulation. Now, uh, you just had the DoorDash IPO. You've got other IPOs potentially coming this year, like Didi. You know, given the, the, the volatility in the markets, what, what is your outlook and what should we be watching for in terms of SoftBank exits? I mean, I, I think sometimes you got to look at the past, you know, the Vision Fund, which is a fund that is performing, you know, uh, as we've been very public, the fund is performing, you know, relatively well. As a matter of fact, the fund is doing really good. You, you have to measure in the past and you look at the amount of IPOs. I think we've had already 12 IPOs in the Vision Fund. And today, you know, there's a lot of a lot of our portfolio companies that are constantly being invited through to do IPOs or to go public via SPACs. So I think there's a there's a big appetite today for a lot of these tech companies rather than take one more round of private capital to basically hit the IPO market via a traditional listing or via a potential SPAC. I mean, and, and a lot of these companies, I think, that will take advantage of those opportunities because uh, there's great demand from institutional investors or this new breed of retail investors to be able to invest in the big disruptors of this decade and the next decade. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, I know you can't speak to the WeWork lit litigation specifically, but in general, could you see WeWork getting back on the IPO track this year or perhaps a SPAC? So WeWork, we have been with the company now for a year. Right, it's um, with my partner Sandeep. He's the CEO. I'm the executive chairman, and we have put together a very clear plan on how to turn around WeWork, and we make it. You know, we've we've been very bold in saying that we expect WeWork to be profitable towards the end of this year or towards the end of next or towards the beginning of next year. So the WeWork turnaround is not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. And the pandemic plays a role with that. So once a company has it's in the right track to become profitable, sure, you know we get we we, we get a. I mean, I don't think there's a week that doesn't go by where we have new investors who want to invest money in WeWork because they're seeing, you know, they're seeing what's going to happen to the world of work after the pandemic, and sure, we have we have SPACs approaching us, you know, on a weekly basis. I mean, one is we were humble that that is happening because a year ago nobody wanted to even be associated with WeWork and the fact that there's a high level of interest from our customers, from the realtors, from landlords, from the financial community, is something that we're humble and that it's it's a tribute to the amazing workforce of, of uh, WeWorkers that we have all over the world. Time will tell, you know, what is the right way to monetize WeWork, but right now we're heads down on turning the company around. And you mentioned the Vision Fund. Um, you say it's doing well. There have been some, you know, high-profile stories, uh, lots of personnel departures. You know, how confident are you um, in, you know, their performance this year, um, given that they did, you know, they did have to take some lumps over the last couple of years? You know, we're in a quiet period, and we'll be announcing results. Uh, I think that in the next few days. But what I can tell you is. The, or large bets that we made in the Vision Fund, you can look at them today, and those are the bets that are changing the world. So I would say what, what I love about Massa, about the Vision Fund, about our company, is our strategy hasn't changed. Pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post-pandemic, and I think the world has realized that most of the investment bets that we made are actually working out, and that is reflected in, in terms that our stock today is trading at an all-time high, which is something at the end the market realizes the potential earnings of the future, the, the future potential earnings on investments that we have made. And you know, I I, I love our strategy. I think uh, it's right on in terms of you know companies that utilize artificial intelligence to disrupt our companies that are going to win in the future. And you know, I think time will tell, but I think we're in a very good position. Now, before we go, Marcelo, I want to ask you about the Opportunity Growth Fund. You know, this hundred million dollars, another hundred million dollars. You um, announced last year you'd be uh, putting into companies led by people of color. 
What is the progress on that? And what are you learning about how hard it has been for some of these entrepreneurs who may have had great ideas and great companies to get in front of the right people? So I would say that that's one of the most rewarding parts of my job, where one day I saw, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Latino, I'm Hispanic, and I, I founded a very large company called Brightstar. We became the world's largest company in my industry. And God, it was hard to raise money. It didn't matter that we had a successful business. So I experienced it myself, but it's something we don't talk about. And then when the, the whole uh, Black Lives Matter uh, started getting a lot of publicity, I was I kept on reading and people saying, yes, I support the black community, I support the black community, but people weren't doing anything. And I said, okay, we're gonna lead by example and we're gonna put a fund that is solely dedicated to entrepreneurs of color. So they know that if they have a good business, they have a place to go. It's been amazing. We have, we've examined over 700 companies. We've made close to 25 investments. And the quality of these entrepreneurs is as good as any other white entrepreneur that we have invested. But they didn't have a source of capital. And, uh, and now they have a source of capital. They feel very comfortable. And we're investing. I mean, there, I don't think there, is, there isn't a single week where I don't have an investment committee that we're not making commitments into one or two companies a week. And it's great. And we're going to see some amazing companies because I mean, the only thing they were lacking was capital. And now that we've provided them the opportunity, you know, they're, now they're going to be able to thrive just like any other entrepreneur.